greet you with grace and peace, and I welcome you to University Public Worship here in Stanford Memorial Church. This morning, I am joined by my colleagues, the Reverend Dr. Sakina Young-Skaggs, our seminary and fellow, Annalise Deal, and our university organist and director of Memorial Church Choir, Dr. Robert Hugh Morgan. This morning, I mentioned to the choir how lovely it was to see Memorial Church Choir once again up in the balcony, singing every single morning here. We are so grateful for this volunteer choir who comes each and every Sunday to be with us, so thank you. We are also grateful for our volunteers who make this possible, for Richard Duncan, for our acolyte Amy Arhus, and today for our reader James Juma. Thank you so much for your participation in this community. Today's service can be found in your bulletin. The liturgy is printed there for you to follow along. There are times when we invite you to stand as you are able, and we will give you instructions when you may be seated. Today, our hearing assistance devices are currently being repaired, and so we apologize those are not available this morning, but we do have large print bulletins uh, which are available this morning to follow along in the liturgy. This is the day that God has made for us. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. I invite you to come and join together in worship here at University Public Worship. Will you rise as you are able for our opening hymn? Lord, you 
You know how many times I thought I knew how to run my life, how to fix their problems, and how you should answer prayer. But each time, through trauma or tragedy, hardship or hard times, you remind me how much I do not know about your will. Though I may not like it at the time, please remind me that you are God and I am not. Ask me questions I can't answer. Give me answers I can't comprehend. Remind me that you laid the earth's foundation, that you speak and the winds obey, that you squeeze the clouds till rain falls. Then give me the good sense to hold my peace and meditate on what you've just said. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. The first reading for today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. Listen for the word of God. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For you grew up from us like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. You had no form or majesty that we should look at you, nothing in your appearance that we should desire you. You were despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, you were despised. And we held you of no account. Surely you have borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But you are wounded for our transgressions crushed for our iniquities. Upon you was the punishment that made us whole, and by your bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on you the iniquity of us all. You are oppressed and you are afflicted, yet you did not open your mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so you did not open your mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who would have imagined your future, for you are cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of God's people. They made your grave with the wicked and your tomb with the rich, although you had done no violence and there was no deceit in your mouth. Yet, it was the will of the Lord to crush you with pain. When you make your life an offering for sin, you shall see your offspring and shall prolong your days. Though you will of the Lord shall prosper. Through you, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of anguish, you shall see light. You shall find satisfaction through knowledge. The 
righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and you shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot you a portion with the great, and you shall divide the spoil with the strong, because you poured out yourself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Continuing, the second reading for today comes from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Listen for the word of God. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. The high priest is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since they themselves are subject to weakness. And because of this, they must offer sacrifice for their own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my beloved child. Today I have begotten you. And it says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of God for the people of God.
gospel reading for today comes from the gospel of mark chapter 10 verses 35 through 45. listen for the word of god james and john the sons of zebedee came forward to jesus and said teacher we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you and jesus said to them what is it that you wish me to do for you and they said grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in all your glory jesus said to them you do not know what you are asking are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But... To sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called to them all and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be servant of all. For the Son of Humanity came not to be served, but to serve, and to give their life a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is okay to give applause. It is okay to clap your hands. It is okay to stand on your feet and wave your hands and give praise. And I just want to give applause to that wonderful anthem, both of them. Put your hands together. It's all right. The only person making noises up here should not be the readers, but also you are part of this space and place. And so you are welcome to clap your hands, sing. I should hear joyous singing during the hymns. Make some noise and give God some praise. That's all right, too. Amen? Amen. Thank you for that wonderful anthem. And I was terribly moved. My heart was swayed by your 
by your rendition of Deep River. Well, it's always a humble honor and privilege to stand behind the sacred desk on behalf of the Lord with the task of the preaching moment. I want to first take a moment to thank Dean Tiffany Sandward and the entire Office for Religious and Spiritual Life team who stood in the gap as this child of God had to leave on a sacred family errand. So I'm back, and I'm grateful for every card, every kind word, deed, act of kindness, and prayer of this community. Thank you, and I cannot say thank you enough. <sighs> it's preaching time. First, I want to be clear theologically that the lecture pairing today is what? It's wrought with theological challenges and mismatched linguistics that could make any preacher's head spin. And to make any attempt to truly disentangle the Isaiah text from the Mark text gospel is more of a Herculean feat than I may have time for today. Save it for me to say, read Isaiah for yourself and the Hebrew text as a standalone text for today, I will not engage in that task of er errantly placing that text as a theological map onto the Christian text of Mark and the journey of Jesus to the cross by conveniently importing Israelite prophecy into the Christian gospel, which is an uncomfortable road many preachers take. In my own down-home voice, this is not what we're going to do. <laughs> Instead, we are going to do, we're going to wrestle. We're going to wrestle with our focused text today of Mark and hear what saith the Lord to us on that word. So pray with me and for me as we go to the throne of grace. Let us pray. <sighs> Breathe on us, breath of God. God forbid if I should glory except in the cross. God of grace and God of glory, breathe on us and on your maidservant this day that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight. May you stir us up this day in the spirit that our hearts may be purified, the word glorified and the church edified. In the name of all that is sacred and holy, we pray. And the people of God said, amen. Amen and amen. amen. So, through the sacred text readings today from the lectionary, throughout the songs and even in the prayers woven into the liturgy in our program, we have returned again and again to the majesty and magnitude of this awesome God. A God that reigns and rules, a God that is mighty in power, a God whose love is healing and grounded in the desire to care for the communal kingdom of God. A God who the contemporary hymn writer Michael Smith penned simply, our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Some of y'all know that. Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. You might have learned it in a praise group or in a youth group. Our God is an awesome God. The awesomeness and magnificence of the divine can lead us at times to get caught up in that otherworldly, the magnitude of the imagined possibilities, what, what theologians like to call eschatological hope, the fancy term. Uh, the awe of the other side is what it really is. That awesomeness, a sense that we are on a journey toward something, something big. From the earliest writings of Paul and the disciples through church history to modern theological scholars today, the future awe of eschatological hope have been central to Christian discourse, to faith discourse. And in short, they're asking, what will happen when we get to glory? What will happen when Christ comes in his fullness? Where will we be? 
when that day comes? Where will we be individually and collectively? This we have pondered for generations. But here is the lesson in Mark Jesus gives us. There is a sanctified pause, a hold on, a wait a minute, a monumental scratch, if you will, to stop the music. Jesus says, that's then, but we live in the now. This is now, now in the living. That's then, this is now. Somebody say it with me, that's then. Oh, come on, I need to hear y'all, talk with me. That's then, this is now. Y'all gotta help me preach. <laughs> In our gospel today, we wrestle with how we are to live our faith with a heart filled with hope of life eternal. That's then, that life eternal. But this is in the now. The gospel of Mark, we find Jesus in conversation with the disciples, having one of those important wisdom teaching moments indeed. Despite the now of their moment, because in the last 10 chapters, the last nine chapters, they wrestle with the coming persecution that Jesus lays out for them and the suffering that he will endure. Despite the now of the politics of the day, where scheming pious political politicians and keepers of religious regularity violate humanity of others to sustain their power. In the case, in their case, it was the Pharisees and Sadducees. Despite their now of state-sanctioned death and dying, which lined the streets, in their case, it was the Appian Way, where over 6,000 were crucified. Despite their now of a Roman rule which shaped their way of life as one of subjugation, political oppression, and economic exploitation. Y'all can hear it. And in spite of these, two wide-eyed disciples, James and John, recognized that something big is coming and they wanted to be part of whatever that would be, the change in their condition. They dared to hope beyond their now, beyond their status, mm -hmm, beyond their rank, mm -hmm, their burdens, they long for something better, and they ask Jesus for the best. But here's the thing. Jesus does hear them out. And Jesus responds with a question. He looks into their hearts to ask them, are you ready for what's to come? The two dare to ask for privilege. Uh, it's simply asked, are you ready to walk? where I walk. Jesus said, can you live where I live and suffer as I suffer? The metaphorical cup and baptism of Jesus that was to come prior to the formation of his glory and a kingdom. Despite all the teachings prior to this point, the disciples still long for status and rank. In a Roman world, much like today, status, power, position, wealth, prestige, shaped and defined the modality, the way in which you lived. It shaped your quality of life, what luxuries and leisures you did or did not have. And yes, while these were what individuals strove for day in and day out, Jesus offers a different perspective. In his response, to John and James, and to the other disgruntled disciples. They, they were disgruntled because how dare they ask those questions, because they too longed for status and rank. Rather than the Roman or European way, Jesus offers the way of a Palestinian Jewish rabbi, as a teacher, as a humble man. He says that the way we are to follow is different and distinct, set apart, and peculiar. For we are a peculiar people. Their ways are not our ways. He, he counters the notion of tyrannical governance 
the aristocratic and hierarchical economic power, you know, the dog-eat-dog -dog climb to the top of status. He says, it's not the way for those who have a place in the kingdom of God. The way of faith is lived as a servant and in love. And yes, despite being told this repeatedly, uh, despite knowing that their life they would have to endure, struggles and trials and tribulations, these disciples wanted to know that on the other side, what was their reward? But Jesus makes it plain. That's then, and this is now. And in the now, we are to live a life of service. In the now, believers are to walk a journey that is not exalted, but one of service to others. Service and faith, we find in Jesus the message, a message of relief, not merely one of reward, but the reward was to salvation, hope, love, and peace. The release, not from service, but release in service, because through service there was a release from domination over others and a release to be in relationship, you know, to be in relationship with one another, free to love one another. A release from the constant pressure to strive to be the best and be the top dog. A release and liberation from the pursuit, not of happiness, but liberation from the pursuit of power and status, because, you know, that can be tired. For the disciples, who were always vying for honor and rank, this kind of shift, this kind of paradigm shift, this kind of thinking differently was hard. For it is a reversal from the ingrained values that many have. Jesus continues to turn upside down the values of power, status, and rank toward faith-filled values of self-sacrifice, servant leadership, and triumph in the face of unimaginable struggle. Now let's be clear how difficult it is to renunciate those worldly values of greatness. Everybody wants to be great. Everyone wants reward and status. It's difficult to embrace a life of service. But I want to say here that service does not mean weak. Service does not mean to operate in a state of oppression or degradation. It does not necessitate the embracing of poverty or constant disparity. Service means to give in service, in whatever way one can, in that true spirit of charity, love, and grace. Absent of self-righteousness, absent of self-aggrandizement, or the demand for honor and recognition. Service is about those who can choose to live in such a way in community with others, where one does not lord over but live together in service to one another, striving toward the holy values of Jesus Christ. Let me say that definition again. Service is about those who can, for everybody can, choose to live in such a way but to choose to live in such a way in community with others where one does not lord over, but live together in service to one another, striving toward the holy values of Christ Jesus. Now returning to the text. The other disciples, verse 42 and following, those other disciples were disgruntled. They were kind of had an attitude. They were indignant. The disciples whose lesson is that second half of the narrative. So Jesus calls the ten, the one he didn't give question to, the one he didn't interrogate, he pulls them aside and makes it plain to them as well that despite the context of the request of James and John, also made a commitment to live a particular life exemplified by Jesus to walk the same journey along with him and to be by his side. He makes it clear this is who they are. And however, despite the position of who is to be at the right hand or the left hand, he defers to God Almighty, saying that's not for him to decide. That's 
position, those positions, high and honored, are reserved. Who are they reserved for? We don't know. That's part of the great mystery. But they're reserved. Somebody will get those res reservations and those positions. But that's not for him to choose. Because this is now, and that is then. But his job in the now was to teach and lead in such a way that his life, Jesus' life, he understood, he explains, is one that is to inspire others to follow his path. Follow a faith-filled life of service and love. To live in such a way that the promise of a future eternal is already reserved. That those reservations are determined in the right now and the right here. That reward, that release, that renewed hope for the future is understood to be embedded in the everyday actions of love, charity, and service. It is how you live it out in the now, how you love it out in the now, how you serve it out in the now, that then we can have a then. And simply put, Jesus asked, how are you living? Is your life following an example of love that leads to your own liberation and the liberation of others? Do you have your eyes set only on the future possibilities, which are distracted by, you know, that apocalyptic showdown, or, or even paralyzed by future fears? So much so that you forget that in the now is where the difference is made in the living, to look up and spread joy of life right now, in the here and now. Yes, all that's coming, that apocalyptic vision in that future, and more. That cosmic showdown of life and death where existence is transformed for all, that's coming, something big. But Jesus in his teachings urges us not to forget we are to live out our faith live out our hope, live and love one another. We are called to, yes, be in high service, be in service. Yes, we are called to excellence. We are called to transform the future in the present. We long, yes, to have assurances. We wait and think. And as hard as it might be, Christ provided the guest book and offers up a way to make reservations. So, I urge you to remember that the reservations are already made for those who live it out in the now. Are you ready? Because that was then, and this is now. Amen.
here, I'm going to ask for one more verse of that, Robert. Dr. Robert G. Morgan, one more verse as we For the benediction, I'd like to do the prayers of the people. And so let us pray together, not just for ourselves, which we are to do, but also for those we love, those in community, those in the nation, and those in the world. Let us pray. Lord, we have been focused on having seats in the kingdom that we almost lost focus on the work of the kingdom. Help us to focus and put our hands to the plow and hold on. Help us to spread the balm of Gilead. Help us to be servant leaders in all we do. God, help us not to become so pious that we are neglecting those who need you most. Let us not become so focused on the everlasting, but shift to what we can do for you today. Oh God, help us to remember not to keep your gift of life to ourselves, but to share it as a charge, as a charge to keep and to glorify God. We have a never dying soul to save and to fit for the sky, as Wellesley reminds us. Help us, God, to live and love out loud in the now. Let us get to work and build God's kingdom while we still have breath in our bodies and life to share in the right here and the right now. And the people of God said amen. So, as a benediction, as we leave this place, but not from God's presence, may we not bask in your word, but let us take what we have learned today and apply it to the needs of our beloved sisters and brothers. May the God of grace and the sweet communion of saints rest, rule, and abide with all of us now and forevermore. Amen.
humanity in the souls of the righteous.